People enjoy pro wrestling for many different reasons, and they enjoy it in their own ways. The largest segment of wrestling fans simply enjoy the performance and don't really seek anything below surface level. There are segments that enjoy the high-flying and crazier spots more than others, and some enjoy some of the more nuanced technical aspects. There is also a large contingent of fans who enjoy the botches of pro wrestling. When things do not go to plan, there is a sort of slapstick entertainment there that many enjoy and they gravitate toward content that will give them their fix for that. One of the drawbacks of this over time is that some men have been reduced to a few clips in how people view their legacy in wrestling. The best case I can think of that has really suffered from this is a man named Steve McMichael, or as he would come to be known as, to the wider public, Mongo. Mongo was a football player turned wrestler. McMichael played college football for the University of Texas at Austin, where he was an All-American and Hall of Fame defensive tackle. He would play professionally in the National Football League, two-time pro bowler and five-time all-pro who was on the winning side of Super Bowl XX with the Chicago Bears. This is more than enough for most men in life and they would take these accomplishments and head back to the house. Mongo's path would be different. Though it was in a lull in popularity, Mongo would see the avenue of pro wrestling as one that interested him. In the build to WrestleMania X, you can see Mongo as one of the football players backing up Lawrence Taylor in his bout with Bam Bam. And not long after, it seemed his mind was made up. In 1995, Mongo would join WCW on the broadcast team, and his banter with Bobby Heenan and strange way of describing the action always reminded me of Dusty Rhodes on commentary. He brought a fun energy to the team, and with his tiny dog in tow, would always have something to contribute to the commentary, whether they needed the contribution or not. After his stint on commentary, it would not be long before the Super Bowl champion was lured out of the broadcast chair and into the ring when Ric Flair would begin harassing his wife at ringside. McMichael would respond by challenging Ric to a tag team match where he would be bringing in fellow American football legend Kevin Green to challenge the horsemen. The two had been longtime friends and were both household names in the football world. Their presence brought a healthy amount of publicity to the company, and with both men's imposing frames, they looked the part. The story would see the two football greats being coached by macho man Randy Savage to help their chances of taking out the horsemen. When the time came for the match between the football greats and the horsemen, Mongo would turn against his partner Kevin Green and join one of the most exclusive factions in wrestling. It was a pretty surprising turn at the time as Mongo's inclusion in the Horseman is confusing on the surface. Looking a little deeper though, with his beauty pageant wife and Super Bowl ring on his hand, Mongo embodied the lifestyle of persistent success like the Horseman. Him being accepted into the group during his first match may be part of some of the feelings people have toward him. Mongo's issues with perception were always that of someone who was seen to be getting handed opportunities that should have been going to people they viewed as real wrestlers. To far too many people, Mongo was seen as some football guy who made a quick stop in wrestling. A big publicity highlight for World Championship Wrestling in Mongo would come when he began a feud with Reggie White. The Green Bay Packers star was ringside at an event, and it kicked off what would become a decent piece of business for the company that would lead to some mainstream sports coverage. Mongo would defeat Reggie White in his highest profile singles match up to that point. Mongo was making some waves in pro wrestling, and instead of doing a match or two, he seemed there to stay. He would show a lot of improvement over time as well. His ability to work the crowd and garner reactions was constantly on display, and he was even aware enough to not only work the audience, 
but he would work to the camera as well. Mongo would spend the first portion of his career in The Horseman without much incident. Kevin Green would show up to get his revenge a year later. Though these matches with other football players were passable by the standard of the participants, they weren't the best. But in fairness to Mongo, even though his most well-known matches were with other football players, it isn't fair to base his ability solely on these matches. With non-wrestlers, you cannot expect much, and in that regard, they over-delivered. Later in the year, an underrated feud with Jeff Jarrett would begin, where some of my favorite Mongo matches would take place. Jarrett and Mongo had such complementary styles to each other that their bouts tended to be the ones that I would enjoy most when looking through Mongo matches. If you want to give Mongo his fairest shake, I think these matches are probably the ones to go off of. Jarrett has fond memories he would share of his time wrestling Mongo. Anyhow, just when you get when I get interviewed, just best match, best opponent, all the kind of best, best, best. And uh, a lot of folks have asked, who's the strongest guy or the quickest guy and all kind of athletic accomplishments? Kurt Angle was uh, a next level uh, athlete. Scott Steiner, another guy. You, you, you look at Big Pop and all of his muscles and you don't realize really how fast and quick he is inside of a ring. Uh, but a lot of times people get surprised when I say, uh, that when I'm asked, who's the strongest guy you've ever been in the ring with? And I immediately say, it's an easy answer. And it's Steve Mongo McMichael. Um, when I went to, and Steve used to call it, and um, you, you, Tony, you will probably remember this. He didn't ever say, uh, here in WCW, it was here in the WCW. <laughs> Is that how Mongo, he always called it the WCW. Uh, but when, uh, 96, 97, uh, when we were doing, um, when I was leading the Four Horsemen, uh, and Rick was on the shelf. Uh, <laughs> Having fun, Rick Nate. We're having fun for Mongo. But uh, I just remember, and I will we'll make this quick. We've got a big panel up here, Conrad. But uh, getting to work with Mongo, and let's just say, and JR could probably say this much more eloquently than I can. Uh, Mongo was not polished in the ring. I, I'll just say that. He, he was not polished. Uh, but he wanted to do uh, a move where I came off the rope and we did a side slam, uh, a lot of spots, and he wanted to do the thing where uh, he would flip me all the way through, and then we call it the Davy Boy Smith kind of power slam is, is what he wanted to go into. And so one night, um, coming off the ropes, he grabbed me, and when he flung me up, he flung me on his left shoulder. And I had no choice, and now we're up there, and he's holding me with his right arm, I'm on his left shoulder and it's awkward as hell and I'm rolling off his shoulder and he just kind of lets go but then grabs me by my shoulders and everything and he picked me and then he got his other arm. I had no choice. He flipped me from one side to the other side on the shoulder and I'm like, what the hell is going on? And then we went to slam. But he was unbelievably strong, uh, just kind of freakishly strong. But uh, yeah, me and Mongo... We had some interesting matches, to say the least, but uh, he was a character, I'll say that, in the WCW. As WCW began to lean more into the NWO story, Mongo was not featured as prominently. He would become a mainstay of World Championship Wrestling's Hoss Battles with men like John Nord, Meng, Barbarian, Rick Fuller, and others. During his days in the ring, you would not be able to escape that the man was charismatic and had a larger-than-life personality. His matches can be accused of many things, but you cannot accuse him of being boring. You were never in danger of seeing a shooting star press in a Mongo match, but you were bound to see some sort of move that, be it on purpose or accident, you had probably never seen before or would again. By the end of his WCW run in 1999, Mongo had won the United States Championship and been accepted into one of the most prestigious wrestling stables of all time. After his wrestling run, Mongo gave up the big lights to enjoy life at home. To this day, Mongo is a legend in Chicago 
and beloved by all who are lucky enough to meet him. The point of this isn't to try to convince you that Mongo was an unsung technician forgotten by history. Rather, I would like to try to explain why it takes men like Mongo being on a roster to give a level of unpredictability and a rugged realism to the art form. Mongo probably never did a move the exact same way two times. He would always land just a little off or throw his moves in a way that looked nothing like what his peers would be doing. When I look at Mongo, I am reminded of another wild football player who made his way to wrestling, but he is seen in a far more gracious manner. That man was known as Dr. Death Steve Williams. Williams was a starter for the Oklahoma Sooners. He was a legend at the school and would go on to play professionally for a brief time. The man known as Dr. Death would join the ranks of professional wrestling and was known for running through opposition in brutal fashion. Dr. Death was not throwing moves that looked very pretty either. Dr. Death matches always felt like someone could die and there was an element of danger to it. He would just throw people in ways that seemed like he hated them and it was something he was praised for and he is still held in high regard for his amazing bouts. Dr. Death is not known for his botches, but instead known for being a hard-hitting and unpredictable warrior from the gridiron who put on memorable and fun matches to watch. I see a lot of similarities to him and Mongo. I would have loved to see Mongo have a run in Japan to see how he would have paired up with many of the guys who were there at the time and had it taken place. Who knows what kind of conversations would center around him now. Am I saying Mongo should have won the Triple Crown? Not really, but to be fair, we never saw how over Mongo could have been in Japan. And if Bob Sapp can become the world champion in Japan, I refuse to count Mongo out. Mongo would make one more big appearance in wrestling at Bound for Glory 2008 as the referee for a Monsters Ball match. Mongo wasn't the fastest at getting down for the count, but you could tell he still loved being in front of the audience and that he had a great time returning to pro wrestling. Life hasn't been the kindest to Mongo in recent years. He unfortunately lives with Lou Gehrig's disease. Mongo has to have a lot of help these days, and seeing him in his current state is hard, but everyone around him says that the legend has remained positive as I was preparing this video, it became clear that most of the wrestling opinions out there toward Mongo and his wrestling career were negative, and I found that sad. From his matches being uploaded with disrespectful titles, to similar disrespect extending to reviews on his online wrestler profiles. As popular and easy as it is to be negative, there is a hope in all of this that there are some out there who can see it the other way. The hope of the video is that if some were to go out and watch his work without any preconceived notions of what they have been told, there may be a few unknowing Mongo fans. Maybe he isn't your kind of wrestler and that is okay too. This is only a case being made that if you go and look at a few Mongo matches, it's almost guaranteed he will surprise you. And I dare to say, you may find one that you like. You know, that Mongo character fooled them all, didn't they, Turley and Hippo? You know, when you get them to underestimate you, that's their ass, isn't it?